before um, Labor Day. Yeah, I was going to say Memorial Day. Where's time <laughs> gone? Um, so the real hero here is Jacqueline. She's done all the planning and done most of the reaching out to everybody. And uh, the Historical Society is a stakeholder, and um, you know I'm here to support and try to pull together all of the elements and the help that she needs to make it go. So with that, thank you, Jacqueline. And it looks yep. like we've got a nice crowd. And give us your feedback. You know, there might be things we can approve for the next one. Right. So uh, let us know what you think. So as you guys know, this was all part of that National Endowment for the Arts Big Read uh, grant that we received. Uh, one of the events that we were to have to go along with Thornton Wilder's book, Our Town, were these cemetery walks. The third act of Our Town takes place in a cemetery. The people, the ancestors are sitting there and they're talking. Um, so we thought, well, what better way to celebrate that part of the play than to have these cemetery walks. Um, and so Lori and I, we started actually in February, snow this deep, walking around here trying to read the tombstones to see who was where. <laughs> um, so we came up with, we kind of divided the cemetery up into four quadrants. And so this will go to that, that straight across tree line right here behind the O'Donnells. Um, and we're doing this northern section today. Um, we've, we're working on figuring out what the other section dates will be, which ones will fit into which dates. And we're also going to do the township cemetery downtown. So we'll hit all five, all five spots in the next five walks. Um, so we've reached out to some of the families. The Lafreniers are a big bunch here, and they've got their fingers in a lot of the other families as well from here. So I asked Alvin if he would give us a little history of the Lafreniers on, on the island and tell a couple stories, and that's really what we're looking for is just some kind of oral history. Um, and Joe's going to be taping us, and those will be archived at the um, at Historical Society for future use. So we're going to let Alvin take it away now. And this is our great grandparents. This is Nelson Lafreniere Sr. His real name was Narcassus. He came from uh, Quebec. He and my grandmother were from Quebec. He was two, where he lived was two days horseback ride from Quebec City. Quebec is so huge that back in those days it was measured by how many days horseback ride from one place to another. So he was from two days horseback ride out from uh, Quebec City. And this is our grand, great grandmother, Cecilia. Her maiden name was Cecilia Clement. Her mother was a Renault of the Renault automobile people of France. She lived in Quebec City. Her dad was the mayor of Quebec City for quite some time. And he didn't like it when his daughter went off to marry a lumberjack. There was a good dancer. So they had made an arrangement. In fact, they you made your marriage arrangement. She was still supposed to marry some stuffed shirt there in Quebec City, but she liked that guy that could dance real good, so she, <laughs> she went with him. <laughs> so uh, that's our great grandparents there. And our, my grandmother Sophia is there, Sophia Boyle, and Mary Ann Blispy was Mary Ann Boyle, that's her sister. So they didn't go far away from one another once they, when they passed away. So that was Pete Sophia Boyle. <laughs> Mary Ann Boyle there, who was uh, married to Ted Gillespie. So that's where they're at. And this is our grandfather, Nelson Lafreniere. Alvin, can you face us when you're talking, please? Yeah, and uh, Nels, that's our grandfather, Nelson Lafreniere. Again, his name was Narcassus. But when they got here, they dropped the French part of it, and this went with, with Nels. And then our grandmother, Sophia, she died in childbirth, given a, a, a birth to Sophia Jr., who was here. So she was 39 when she died and left nine children. When she died, I gave birth to this one. Alvin? Alvin, just one, right behind you is Winifred Laffineer. Mm -hmm. And if you look at 1919, she was to be married to a fellow who owned a big hotel in Cadillac, Michigan. My mom was named after her. Right. And she died of the Spanish flu before she, she could be buried. Yeah, oh. she died from that virus of uh, 100 years ago. Alvin, could you talk up just a little bit? Yeah, uh, hopefully he can, that, could pick up a little bit more. But uh, anyway, uh, she was born uh, out down state, and she died in 1919 from that flu epidemic. And the one back here, Boyle, that's one of my grandma Sophia's brothers. 
So uh, there's the Lafaniers and some of the boils here. Like Mary Ann was one of my grandma's sisters. The Hugh Boyle back here, that, that's, her, uh, that's her brother. And then if you get back over here is Bossy Lafaniere. Uh, you, I, you know, he's right there, the one with the flag there. And uh, during World War II, he was working out in Indiana as a lineman, stretching, putting up lines for the telephone company. So he got drafted in the Army, so when they said what he asked, said what his occupation was as a lineman, that's what he did in the Army. Same thing he did, stringing telephone lines. Back then, you lay them on the ground for a couple of miles from one to the other, and they would get tanks would run over them, artillery shells would cut one up. So he'd be forever going out and repairing them. And then when that was done, when the movie army would move forward, you rolled up all your wire, you moved the eight miles forward with them, laid all the wire out, go repair it with artillery shells and yeah. wreck it, tank would run over. So they kept pretty busy laying wire down, picking it up, laying it down. So that's what he did. Down at the end of the line, that's Bud McDonough, that would be uh, our first cousin. He and then of course Skip is down there. So that's, they go to, down here the full length of it here. And then uh, our grandfather, great grandmother, and Aunt Winifred is there. And of course another one of grandma's brothers and sister here. So that takes care of that. And then you're not going to be able to hear if we go back further. But well, everybody can just move this way. <laughs> okay, behind. Uh, Behind Grandpa's tomb, that's uh, Pat Lafaniere buried there. And then uh, the one with the flag, that would be Paul Lafaniere. That's be another one of my grandparents' grandsons, Paul. You'd all would remember Jerry Lafaniere. That's his, that's his youngest brother. This was my dad here and my mother. She was a Conahan, Francis Conahan. And uh, this October, she would, would have been 100 years old. Dad served in, uh, he was in the Coast Guard here back in the 30s. He joined the Coast Guard in 1935, so he was on duty at the Coast Guard station the day the Merrill blew up. And he knew all those guys were on the Merrill, and he had worked on the Rambler with Bruce McDonough for three years. So he thought the world of Bruce McDonough. And he was the only Coast Guard left at the station that day. The rest of them got on the Coast Guard boat, went out to Simmons Reef. But uh, they, had, they couldn't abandon the Coast Guard station, so Dad was on duty there. And uh, he said that was the longest day of his life. With that day, day. And White McDonough went over there to the station and uh, got Cole, trying to find some good news. But there was no good news coming from Simmons Reef then. Then in 1933, he went in the Navy, and he served in the Pacific. But of all the things that went on in the Pacific, even his ship was hit by a bomb, off Luzon Island, he said that's children compared to the day the Merrill blew up. That was the worst day of his life. Then over here, that's uh, Helen and Dave Pike. All of you would remember Helen. She just passed away a couple of years ago. Dave was in the Merchant Marine during World War II, and so that's why he had the flag. And Helen is buried next to him. The next flag, that's Buster Elms. A lot of you uh, know Don and Nancy Trish. Uh, Nancy that be Nan that's Nancy's dad. I don't think so. So uh, Buster's there and Rita. So he was in the Coast Guard. He was here on Beaver Island at the time when Pearl Harbor was bombed. He was the cook for the Coast Guard station. He said he just made lunch for the guys. He was cleaning up the kitchen, had the radio on, having a cup of coffee after he fed the guys lunch when the report came over the radio about the attack on Pearl Harbor. So he was on active duty at the Coast Guard station here. And then uh, even Alvin, Lloyd... I'm sorry, but you have to tell everybody that Helen and Rita were sisters of Archie. Yeah. I was just how they, how they yeah. fit yeah. into the yeah. Alvin, <laughs> I assume they knew that. No. Before. I was oh just going to suggest that for people here that don't know, you tell the names of all of the children that Sophia Boyle and Nell Glaffner had so they understand all of these people like Rita, Alan, and Parker. If you give all the names of all the kids, they're away. Okay, we 
we will have interruptions from the airport from time to time, <laughs> including two weeks from now and two weeks after that. So we can't very well shut the airport down. Yeah, uh, but uh, Grandpa Nelson and Sophia had uh, quite a few children, and uh, they're all buried here in the cemetery. Now, uh, Rita Elms, she was the youngest. She was only two years old when Grandma died, so she never knew her mother. And uh, Helen was uh, 101 when she died. And as you know, she just died a couple years ago, so they were sisters. And then Eva and Lloyd are buried over here, and uh, Eva was the oldest. She was 15 years old when, when Grandma died. Dad was 12 years old when his mother died. And then Uncle Pat is back here. He was the oldest son. And then there was uh, Bussy, who's over here, and then Dick, who's, who's over that way. So Dick isn't buried right here with them. He's the only one that isn't. The, the others are. Dad? So, and then, uh, well, then Mother's still saying Pat and Winnie. She was at Cunningham, so. I didn't hear that. Pat and Winnie, too. Hmm? Pat and Winnie. Yeah. So, uh, well, Lawrence, Lawrence. Lawrence and Winnie are here. They're over here. Right. And uh, he, met, he met one of the siblings. One of the kids was Winnie. Yeah, Winifred. Yeah, yeah. named after uh, this Winifred that that, was, yeah. that died from the yeah. from, this, from the Spanish flu. And, no. Yeah. So Grandpa had a sister Eva, and she's not buried here. She died down. She's down near Traverse City, buried in a cemetery there. So and then Winifred. So he named two of his sisters after two of his daughters after two of his sisters. So uh, anyway, the Lawrence and Winnie are here. Winnie was uh, another sister. Lawrence worked on the ore boats for a while. He farmed. Then, as you know, he worked with the Beaver Island Boat Company for close to 40 years. And then his two sons, Kevin and Joe, also worked for the boat company for many, many years. We have Pam here. She's going to talk about the, uh, the McDonough family. Mm -hmm. Well, down there is Carol Ann Lafner. That would be Jerry Lafner's uh, first wife. And uh, young Jerry's. Uh, mother, and she's buried there. You can see where it says Carol Ann Lafanier. So that would be here of all the Lafaniers, and then Percy O'Donnell's are here. Well, you got Joan. She's not dead yet. No. Joan had two husbands. They're both there, and she's going to be very big with them there. Someday, but uh, we're not. We're, we're not trying to. I try to avoid that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that would take care of the, the lock in there part. Here. Okay. Well, Pam, do you want to? Where are you? Yeah, and Ed's going to. Yeah. So Ed, Ed Woj and right, and I'll do the McDonough side, even though we're. Lafaniers too. It's uh, everyone's related our, around here. Our families were the McDonough's and Lafaniers. Eva, well, um, my sure Bob, oh God, the holidays. Right, right. He's yeah. not buried there. He's yeah. in Grand Rapids. So to begin with, um, in the census in the 1858s, um, Sylvester McDonough and Ellen Corey, who uh, homesteaded. There'll be a lot of interruptions. Okay. <laughs> They're over in that section of the uh, cemetery. And they came here with a woman by the name of Big Mary. That was Sylvester's um, sister. And I know my dad still talked about her. She was a mountain of a woman over six foot tall. And when the men couldn't get the, the boat in the water, they'd call on her. And she was so strong, she'd launch the boat. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, from when you have a good name like Sylvester, then you're going to name some of your other kids the same name. So my grandfather, our grandfather was Sylvester Sylvester, and they lived at Sand Bay. And they are buried, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. right in here. And Mary Conahan was his wife and where present day CMU is they used to have a store so the Conahans, um, it was my grandmother Mary there was a Tess and Mabel Cull who was also a Conahan and then they had a brother Hugh and so anyway because the McDonough farm was there on Sand Bay 
and the Conahan farm was there on Sand Bay, Mary and Sylvester got together and had a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> the first child, a lot of people uh, may not recognize, but her name was Genevieve. And the islanders, um, sometimes when they had illnesses, they didn't quite understand all of those illnesses. So when she was two years old, she fell out of um, a high chair. And they said she died of meningitis, but it was probably an intracranial bleed. And so she's actually buried back over there. And Sophie McDonough has taken her on. Um, so from there, we have, um, there was um, your grand Lloyd, grandfather, Lloyd, Lloyd McDonough. McDonough. There was also um, oh. Bruce McDonough. And Bruce is the one who Alvin had mentioned um, blew up on the Merrill. Now, Bruce McDonough, according to my father, was the most loved of all. He could fix anything on Beaver Island. And he was married to Sadie, we call her Peter Nard, um, now, which is Kay Messini's um, mother. So Kay Messini is actually a McDonough as well. Um, One thing I should interject is these families always, always extended names on for generations afterwards. You talked about the first Cecilia Laffineer. Well, my grandmother Eva Laffineer McDonough's middle name was Cecilia, and three of her grandchildren have that middle name. It, all, it extends through five generations. And well, Bruce, Bruce Mary, as well. Uh, Mary, Mary Laffineer Minor. Her my middle name is Bruce. Mike McDonough's middle name is Bruce. Uh, the Messini son's middle name is Bruce. All after Bruce McDonough, mm -hmm. the first Bruce, that was my mother's uncle and your uncle. But, you know, uh, getting a little closer, I always remember Grandpa Vesti being called Vesti Vesti. That was his nickname and the Irish way of identifying people because he was the son of the first Sylvester that mm -hmm. came here. And I was always told, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Vesti came here with Ellen Corey, his wife, and he also came with Ellen's sister and his brother-in-law, Tom McCauley. And they settled next to each other down on Sand Bay. My mother always used to say, before the WPA days, when they extended the road to, from Kings Highway to Tom McCauley's farm, down through the swamp to East Side Drive, she said, we'd have to get to the top of the hill and turn right and open three gates before we got to Grandpa's house. That meant her grandfather, Vesti's house, turning right over her Uncle Tom's house. But those two brothers married two sisters, and, and the, the original river that's there that's now called the Jordan River was always at first Vesti's River, and Tom McCauley's road was after his brother-in-law. But um, in the 40s, Gus Milkey was naming things and putting up signs and he put up Jordan River on Vesti's River and Cables Creek down at uh, Lake Genesworth, which was the true first Jordan River. So nobody said anything and it stuck. They call it the Jordan River now, but it's really Vesti's River originally. Yeah, Vesti's right. Creek. So but a lot of these people have their names all over this island. The names and places section of the first volume of the History Journal tells a lot of that, but our maps do too. And you can still see there's an old, um, un, they're just pilings right now, but there's an old um, dock down there. And at one time, I know they had 230 sheep and a schooner would come in, they would fill that boat full of wool and it would go out. They also sold a lot of beef. They usually had 30 head of beef. And back in the 30s, I understand it was a year that we didn't have any rain and the grass didn't grow for the, um, to feed the um, cows and things like that. And Willie Schmidt down here at where Tommy McDonough now owns, he lost all of his cows. They starved to death that one winter. And I know dad had spoken about all of his brothers going out and cutting brows, and they didn't lose any of their cows. But they also brought in a, um, one of the uh, 
boats, yeah, they, the Coast Guard the es boats. Escanaba. Right, and loaded came with, with hay. hay. Right, and the cows ran right down onto the ice and ate the hay right off the boat. So, um, you know, these people, they went through some rough times, but they always had family, and I think they supported each other in good times and in bad. Um, they were hardy, really. Uh, they at McDonough's down there where the Jordan River, we call it now, is, uh, they brought sheep in late and had a big sheep farm when the coyotes came to the island. And they weren't here naturally, they had to have come over on the ice and they started on the sheep. And uh, I remember hearing stories about Grandpa Vesti, Mary Cunahan Vesti, when the men were away in the daytime and there'd be uh, some bawling out there, she'd look out and see that there was a coyote among the sheep and she'd get the gun out and shoot them. <laughs> <coughs> she ended up living with her sister in later years in the call house, we call it, downtown now, because that was Mabel Conahan Call's house and she uh, lived next door in the second apartment toward the Gillespie house and uh, ended up there and lived to be quite old. But, I think she, was uh, she was quite a lady too. Uh, yes, she I was. Remember. She yeah, was. Yes, right. she was. Elsa oh. Laffner, I remember him in the store. I was just a little kid, but I remember running the store there. And I also, uh, McDonough's store, Eva was so brains behind that. <laughs> I was always. Oh. Well, you know, Nels had a store, but when Eva got married, a store came up for sale, the Beaver Island Lumber Company store, the Grills had, and she decided that she and Grandpa Lloyd McDonough were going to buy it and run it and compete with her father. And she did, and that store is still operating with her grandsons today. Right, yeah. All right, and there's a lot of things. I lived two years with Lloyd McDonough my last two years of high school, and uh, he told me so many stories about the island and things here. There's these, I, these families intermarried in a way. Two McDonough brothers, Lloyd and, and Lawrence, married two Laffineer girls, Winnie and Eva. Right, yeah. And uh, so we're all mixed in on Laffineer's side. Right. I'm a younger generation, though, like Vesti was my great grandfather, but the older generation <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was her grandfather. <laughs> nice, Ed. nice. But there's thousands of stories about all of these. You talk about the Merrill and Bruce McDonough and the Everett and Raymond Cole being lost. Uh, Dick Laffineer told me one time, in the winter time, we didn't have that much to do here, and you'd go to the store and you'd have to sit and uh, have a short one with uh, Uncle Dick, and he'd talk for two hours. He told me about finding some old records when um, the Merrill went out to get the gas off of the J. Oswald Boyd at Simmons Reef. Nell said, no, we're not doing it. And he was a stockholder in the company and owned enough of it to be able to stop it. He said, it's too dangerous. You've got to run through too much green ice too far. And it's too dangerous to be taking that gas off that tanker. So they disagreed. And Everett Cole was a very, very aggressive young businessman. He said, we're going. And Nell said, you're not with my stock of the boat. So Everett bought Nell's stock out. and. Dick showed me the paperwork because he was there watching it, and he said to them, this is the bad thing, don't do it. They went and did it, and it blew up, and we lost four island boys. Right. And that was the lifeline. That would be like... And your Uncle Bruce is right over there, right. and Dick Laffner is uh, on the yeah. other side. A lot of people won't recognize the names of a lot of them. Vernon? You'll see Vernon Hugh Laffner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's Dick. So on his tombstone, they put under his name Dick, because that's how we all knew him. He had Dick's store. If you don't have it, we don't need it. Or you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it was Nell's laughing ear, that's what both sides of the family would say, that really um, saw the future of tourism here on the island. And Helen Pike, um, at one time, they owned the King Strang Hotel. Um, there, and then Rita and Buster Elms owned a little, it's called the Old Shillelagh down there in town, which was a restaurant, and occasionally they'd put a little sign on their door out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> My Aunt Betty was born there. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Nels, you know, Nels had a lot of uh, gumption. He was an astute businessman, very intelligent, hardworking man, very family oriented. 
And uh, at the time that he died, or just after, he had set up almost all of his children on Main Street. Uh, Helen and her husband Dave owned the King Strang Hotel. Rita and Buster owned the Shillelagh, which was a restaurant where the Transportation Authority building sits now. Uh, Dick and uh, Pat got the main store, and um, Archie and I think it was Archie and Dick got and the Dan. they got Big the Rock. McCann store, which is oh. now the community center. Oh, the Shamrock. And the Shamrock <laughs> too. And he had all of those businesses. And if you talk about a businessman that wasn't going to lose any revenue. Elvin will verify this. When they moved the shamrock from the harbor side over to the other side, they turned it end for end, but they also had a small set of moving stairs, and they moved it with the door so people could go in and out and keep drinking while they moved the building. <laughs> it all, he also had the very first liquor license in northern Michigan after Prohibition. Before that, they had high... high um, chairs or benches with wings on them and they said they were serving ice cream. <laughs> so Grandpa Vesti and Mary Kenahan, you'll notice we left out some of their family members like Marge Teeter. Yeah. Um, you'll yeah. see the Teeters over there. She left at 16 and actually ran, um, the governor of Illinois asked her to run a, a retirement home and she was very successful um, doing that in Illinois for quite wealthy people. Um, and so in addition to her, Nellie O'Donnell, I mean, this is how we sort of come together. Yeah, but Nellie's, is, Nellie's buried over there. Right. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Um, so Aunt Nellie was also one of my dad's sisters. Well, we should do what we did with the laughing ears. Mary Vesti and Vesti Vesti McDonough had <laughs> Lloyd. Genevieve. Genevieve, then Lloyd. Lloyd. Um, Who's Bruce. Nice? Bruce. Right, and the, there was uh, there was um, Nellie, Nelly, Bob, Bob Holiday. Oh, well, yeah. he was the baby, right. and he was a twin actually. Right. Huh. Um, and so they always said that <coughs> Holiday was lonely. That's why he always liked no. to crowd the party. Well, my grandpa told me that story, and he said. He'd always yell at Bob to get up in the morning to go out to work, and he never wanted to. So well, one day he yelled up, "Bob, get up, get up, come on, let's go." And Bob yelled back, it's a holiday. <laughs> and Vesti yelled back at, at him, it's a holiday every day for you. Get up. <laughs> and his nickname stuck. <laughs> so, so in addition, then you had um, your dad. Right, Lawrence. Right, Lawrence. And then he was at, he died at 101 here. Yeah. And then um, there was Bob and Bob's twin. So, how long did Bob's twin? I didn't well, know Mark Bob had a twin. Teeter that did. she mentioned here. Yeah. Did the did the twin die at in birth. Oh, right. at birth. Okay. Let me tell you a cute real estate story. All right, uh, these families all trusted each other, and Lloyd McDonough, uh, her uncle, my grandfather, was appointed the executor of the Cunahan Estate, which was down the the bay from the McDonough farm, and. Uh, they had a lot of frontage on San Bay, and in the early 40s, late 30s or early 40s, Carl Erber, a businessman from Charlevoix, came over and said to, to Lloyd, I'd like to buy some of that frontage to build a cabin on the beach there. And Lloyd says, okay, how much do you want? He said, I'd like 500 feet. And, and um, Carl Erber says, I'll give you a dollar a foot for it. Grandpa jumped at it and said, absolutely, no problem, I'll get you the deed tomorrow. So he went home above the store, McDonough's old store, and he told Grandma uh, Eva Laffineer McDonough that he had just sold part of her parents' estate property on Sand Bay for 500 bucks, and that was outrageously high at that time. She said, oh my God, um, is it worth that much? He said, no, it's not even worth 50 cents a foot. She said, you took a dollar a foot from him then? My God, Lloyd, what's wrong with you? We don't live that way. You go give him half of that back tomorrow and we'll charge him 50 cents a foot. And that's what Carl Erber paid for it. He's, and the family still has that cabin there on the Jordan, Jordan River. Two O'Donnells here. Yeah, two O'Donnells. Yeah, everything. Come on. Well, most of 
the O'Donnells are over there. But the we are we are called the Danny Barney O'Donnell. Yeah, because we got to hear you. Yes. Okay. Oh, Barney got the, uh, his deed signed by President Grant. And um, when there used to be a beautiful home there, and then it kind of deteriorated over the, over the years. But, um, and then his one of his sons was named Daniel, so that's the Danny Barney. Okay. My grandpa, who's also buried over there, this is going to be confusion. My my grandpa was called the Bay instead of Danny Barney. People thought it was because he lived on the Bay. It wasn't. It's because my grandpa had a Bay horse that he loved. But the O'Donnells over here, um, the what the headstone is so fast. You want to move that way? The name Bass, she was an O'Donnell, that was Margaret, Beverly's sister, passed away a couple of years ago. Their brother, Ronnie, buried back here. Ronnie um, was an en engineer during World War II. Turn toward us, Ben. Okay, and the nephews. Well, I feel like, what's your name, Banna? <laughs> <laughs> and um, this, this headstone was just absolutely beautiful. Belongs to Richie and Janet O'Donnell, Ben's brother. And Janet passed away a couple of years ago, also. Where do you want me? Do you want me to go up there? Yeah, mugs is right behind me. Yeah, I said mug. I said mug. I didn't say the mugs. Well, do you have any tales to tell on your sister? Um, <laughs> oh, 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 I don't want her to come back and haunt me. <laughs> okay. Okay. In in the 70s, I can't do much. Well, my dad was born in 1946. He was 50 in the 70s, in probably 76. And we had a party for him there in Chicago area that lasted like 12 hours. And he was um, going to my mom, said she was drinking at 4 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like that. 4 in the morning. Wow. Anything else about these, Bill? About what? About, about these. Because most of the O'Donnells are over there. There's right. a bunch of them over there. Pam? Yes. Did the crowd catch that Nellie O'Donnell was one of Bessie and Mary Bessie's children that right. married Frank Danny Barney O'Donnell? Yeah, and they're buried <laughs> over there. And, and so the O'Donnell and McDonough families connected and were all cousins. Yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back here, my mom and dad, and my two brothers, John and Jim. My dad's mother was Anna McCauley. She married um, Henry White in Chicago, and that didn't last very long, but mm -hmm. long enough for her to have my dad and my uncle Bud. Um, my dad sailed his whole life, basically. At 17, he was a steward on a ship in uh, Chicago, he, he, and he was also captain of the North Shore, um, but he, and then he was on car ferries, and then for the last, oh, 25 years or so, he was captain of an oil tanker called the MV Detroit, and that, that, that uh, tanker's home was in uh, Calumet Market in Chicago. My mother was an O'Donnell. Um, that's the, the bay. My, remember I said my grandpa was called the bay. That, my mother was the oldest of nine children, and so, and like I said, most of her relatives were over there on that side. And so, and then my brother's buried back there, and Bonnie was in the council. So my dad, they mentioned Mary McDonough was Mabel. Conahan's sister, Hugh Conahan, and 
my dad was one of Daddy, Jack, Ray, Larry is my right dad. here. Yep. Her dad, Larry, Sally, and Rowan. Um, Mary Claire left. She was the daughter of, we were right by the Mom and Pa Gillespie. Um, she was the daughter of Consuela Gillespie and Carl left. Uh, they date back to the 1850s. The Lefts Point down on the west side was from that left side of my family. Um, I said earlier, my mom said she married my dad because it was the only one that she wasn't related to. You not have to anymore, huh? So, uh, that's my mom and dad. Larry calls over there. My grandma and grandpa, Aunt Betty and Uncle Jack and all them are on that quadrant over there. Ray, Ray called was captain. Yep. Yes, my dad, uh, my dad became a captain at like age 12 or 14 or something when his dad bought their second fish tub and the he was taken out of school and at a young young age ran a fish tub was the captain and all the men had to answer to this young lad <laughs> well then obviously he fished until uh, real early 50s and when the fish were gone my dad also went on the Great Lakes like a lot of Beaver Islanders and um, and he never knew on the swim. <laughs> <laughs> All the years on the Great Lakes, and he never knew on the swim. I think there's a lot of Beaver Islanders yeah, that do. Oh, yeah. 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 My mom made sure we all knew how to swim. <laughs> well, tell them how your dad, Ray Carl, graduated from a fish dog to a big freighter and what some of his exploits were. Uh, well, there, there's a lot of stories, and for one of the things that he. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Ed, well, but... your brothers were always proud of the fact that Ray Cowell, who came from Beaver Island, was a big boat, steamboat captain that was very capable. They said one time he was coming in the river where now you have the Silwaukee Bridge across it. Yeah. And uh, uh, something happened and the bridge couldn't open or something and they were stuck. And they said it's the only freighter captain they ever knew that backed a freighter miles up down the middle of a river. From Saginaw all the way out to the Saginaw Bay because he couldn't get to the turn basin. But, um, yeah, my dad started out real young and, like I said, ended up a captain. My brother Michael is also buried here. He was a tugboat captain and maybe you remember back in the 70s, it was a homecoming weekend and he was going up Lake Michigan from Chicago to wherever. Nice, calm night. All of a sudden, there were five barges across the harbor, and Michael just didn't want to miss homecoming, so he pulled them all in here. <laughs> oh, Chicago and said, oh, I, I hit a storm. I had to pull into Beaver Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> I did that one time just to get whitefish from Art Larson. Uh, pulled his, his, his boat in here. Oops. So I, I guess that's all. Oh, I know I should mention. My mom's brother, well, and your, but, your dad was in World War II. You might want to mention. Yeah, that. World War II. My brother Michael was Vietnam. My uncle, my mom's brother, is right like behind you. Says going home on the back of the uh, headstone. And he has a ship on the front of his. He was the captain, uh, based right out of Charlevoix of the Medusa Challenger for many, many years. What, what was his last name? Bud Left. But my mom was originally a left. Next to um, doing our O2 family reunion, he was sitting with South um, Carl, the Larry Carl family, and he told us that before she went down, obviously, she, she was probably on the Medusa Challenger, but that he had previously been on the Edna Fitzgerald. On the Edna Fitzgerald, yeah. My uncle Bud sailed on the Edna Fitzgerald, yeah. Uh, that's just about all I got. I just, well, right here. Uh, most of us didn't know this man. I didn't know him hardly at all either. But you can see he was a medical doctor. He was in the Navy in World War II. Uh, and he went ashore at Iwo Jima with the Marines. And he spent that entire battle uh, patching up wounded Marines and trying to get them evacuated from that island.
So if any, he's the only person I knew that was served at Iwo Jima. So he earns a good rest. Hopefully he's resting well. Yeah. He was a sweet man. Mm -hmm. Alvin, do you know anything about the hills? We got Henry Hills buried underground. Uh, yeah, Henry Hill was. Uh, there was. Uh, Back about uh, 1915, there was a company formed in Chicago, and it was a land company, and they thought Beaver Island would be the ideal place to put a playground for the people of Chicago. So they bought a couple thousand acres down at the south end of the island, practically the whole thing, from Pfeiffer's Orchard all the way down, including Iron Ore Bay. They purchased all that, and they began selling lots, and they were going to raft off some lots. So Henry's mother put in a bid for a lot, so she won two lots. So that was in 1915. So Henry was two years old when he first came to Beaver Island. He came up with his mother and dad to look at the property. The dad wasn't too enthused, but it was right on Cables Bay. So uh, his mother, Anna, was quite pleased with it. So she hired uh, the Coles, Gad Cole and his sons, to build a cabin for them there. So they came and then until Henry died two years ago. So he was the oldest person uh, for years and years of the first tourist here. He was two years old when he came here in 1915, and during World War II he didn't make it back that, that often. So in 1946 he came back. His wife's name was Mary Margaret, and they came over on the ferry boat, the Mary Margaret, and he told them that he had the boat named after her. So she was quite impressed. It was two or three years later before she found out that uh, there was, a little, it was a, a little fib involved in that. But uh, Henry was uh, part of the Storm Society, and he wrote several uh, articles we have in our journals of Beaver Island history. And then he wrote a book, Tales from the South End, about everything that went on down there. And his book is very interesting. And he interviewed a lot of people here on the island to get his information correct. And it's a very good book. If you know, if you haven't read it, it's at the it's at the museum, you can still get it. Tales from the other end. So Another he was he was, right you, he was a wonderful man. Yeah, Doyle Fitzpatrick and Phyllis Fitzpatrick right there. wrote a book too, didn't he, about Yeah, yeah about yeah, yeah. King Strang. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Doyle Fitzpatrick, uh, he was involved with the Story Society as well. And his book, uh, that was he, he wrote his book many, many years ago. And uh, it uh, it's out of print now, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, he was uh, quite involved with that. Did Henry Hill, but he donated all the trees in the new part of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. I said to throw that in because I thought that was wonderful. Yeah. And then two of them didn't make it, and so he got two more sent over there. Very charitable. Yeah, Do you have was... any uh, Gallagher relations here? We've got uh, Lillian and Johnny Andy over here. Anybody want to know anything about them? Johnny Andy Gallagher, he was at most of his time was down at the lighthouse. Wasn't Lillian a great Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and married Lillian Green. But his nickname, because there were a few Gallagher families on the island, just like there are a few O'Donnell families, was Johnny Andy. So they were always called the Andy Gallagher. There were five Gallagher families yeah. here. I can tell lots of things about Bud, but I better not. <laughs> he was one of my best friends. I could tell a lot of tales. How about one? Do one. Do one. Do one, Alvin. Come on. 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 When past where Rita and Buster Elms place is, well, after well, he was a cook for the Coast Guard in World War II, so when the war ended, he got out of the Coast Guard. But then Grandpa had died. Grandpa died in the spring of 1945, so he and Rita took over what was his old store and turned it into a restaurant.
and they lived up above. Well, there was no restrooms up there. They had the outside privy. So come the one Halloween, uh, that's when Bud and Bruce and Donald Cole and a few others, Topper, McDonough, young guys, the big thing they would do then was go and come people's outhouses over. Well, they thought they'd do something a little different. They picked it up, moved it back about four feet. So Uncle Buster came out in the night to do his thing, and he fell into the, into the, oh, no. he fell into the honey hole. <laughs> and he went back up for me to get in, and Aunt Rita wouldn't let him in because he stunk so bad. <laughs> now, this is the last day of October. Can you imagine how cold that harbor is? He had to go down to the harbor and wash himself off, and he came back, and he was fuming. He said, I know damn well your nephews were involved in this. He said, I don't give it. I'm going to kill every damn one of you. <laughs> it was like Herod going to kill. Tell those stories and get them all and take the very best of them and put in a book called Stories from Beaver Island because the oral history here has a lot of cute stories that aren't history that people preserve, but they're being lost now. And we need to start preserving them. Alvin knows a lot of them. I know a lot of them and a lot of other relatives here, the O'Donnells and McDonough's know a lot of them, but... Tell Harlem's horse story. Uh, I'm not sure I know that one. You, oh, Come Bella. on, Loretta. Oh, yeah, you yeah. yeah. brought it up. Yeah. <laughs> Harlem sold his horse to this guy, and the horse oh, died. Yeah. And he went back to get his money from Harlem, and Harlem said, well, he never did that before. <laughs> 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 I'm a question, okay. My great grandfather, Mabel and their father, now he had a store, but then he also fished and he had to have like two miles of uh, shoreline to right. put the uh, pond. On Sand uh, Bay, kind of, Hunts so had a people. store. I know right where it was, there's a yeah. house sitting there now. But they farmed in behind and they had the store and they fished. But in the old days, if you owned the land, then you had the riparian rights out from it to fish that bottom because those fishing rights in front of that land was yours. The state in later years took it away and put it back in the hands of the state or the public ownership. But like Willie John Gallagher, who um, was K. Messini's, um, K. McDonough Messini's um, father, he lived uh, right there now where Dennis Call has a house. Uh, oh, no, it's no. the yep. Messini house Missini. now next to the hall. He bought a mile of frontage on Sand Bay, and it was right from McDonough's cabins all the way down to what is now the township campground. And it's now the Beaver Sand subdivision. But his heir sold that mile of frontage to become the Beaver Sands Platte, because Willie John always had his pond net stakes out in front of that land, because he owned the bottom in front of it. Not anymore, <laughs> but in the old days, they bought the land for the fishing rights. For 6, 1936, uh, uh, a, a tanker, the uh, Boyd, went aground on Simmons Reef. That's about four or five miles north of uh, Hog Island, and the, the crew abandoned it. Uh, back then, when you took the compass off of a ship, that meant you were abandoning the ship. So the Beaver Island Coast Guard went out. My dad was one of the Coast Guards here then. He went out and helped take the crew off, and they came down with the compass. Be around closer. Well, are you bad on the ship? Yeah, because they had the compass with them. So the word went out right away. The ship had been abandoned because the crew took the compass with them. When it went aground, uh, they didn't have any ship to shore radio on the thing, but they did have a teletype. And their office was back in Buffalo, New York, so they t teletyped. But they were ashore. They went aground on a reef, and they didn't know it would cost a lot of money to pull the thing off. So the company just told them to abandon ship. So boats started going out. It became a gas station out there for every boat in northern Michigan. <coughs> every fish tug was stopping and refueling. And, and then after the ice made, you know, people were coming over from the Upper Peninsula in their cars. But there was a salvage operation began from here. And there was a little boat called the Rambler. It was about oh, 80 feet long, a wooden boat. So they began hauling <coughs> oil off it in barrels with that. And the main boat, the ferry boat going back was the Maryland, and that was a lot bigger, and it could have held a lot more, but they were using it every day for the trips to Charlevoix. So they hauled off as much as they could, and every fish tuck was going out from Charlevoix from all over, getting all the fuel that they could get off it. 
Well, then at, when they quit running the Rambler, she laid up for the year, they decided to use the Merrill. The Merrill was a steel deck. And back then, in order to, it, for the, the diesel engine, you had what was called a pup, a small engine. You had to start the small engine, and you needed a flame to start it. You would run that for three or four minutes, get it warmed up. That would kick over the big engine. So the, the boy, or the, uh, uh, on the Rambler, it was the same thing, the same kind of an engine. But in November, there was usually plenty of wind and taking the fumes away. So they made two trips with the Merrill, and everything was fine. Now, my grandpa Nels was part owner. He, owned, he was a quarter owner of it. And my dad was in the Coast Guard, and, and grandpa said, if they use the Merrill, he said, I don't want anything to do with it, but with the steel deck. There's one spark, and you're done. So he had my dad go around and buy and to sell the, the stock. So Lloyd McDonough bought some of it. He was part owner. Everett Cole bought the rest of the stock. Everett was the principal owner of it. So then two days later it went out, and it was a calm day, you know, January 1st. So somebody went down, apparently Bruce McDonough, to start the engine. He needed that open flame. All the gas fumes are down in the hold. So when he went to start it, the whole upper deck came off. It was laying up on top of the boy. And all fire went killed this one. So they never did recover Bruce's body because he, well, he was the engineer. So he would have been down in the hold. And what's left of him would still be down there. You know, so. And Captain Hill came up on the west side of the island, totally dressed with his cap still mm -hmm. on, money in his thing. And I know. Um, Grandma used to have your, your dad, dad and, and dad Bob Holiday about Bruce, yourself, right, yeah. go mm -hmm. around all the time on their on horseback all over the island looking for his body. Well, the two oh. Gold brothers were up on top of the void when the explosion happened, and they were found up there badly burned. And then uh, Captain Hill's body, was, uh, your dad and, and, uh, and Bob uh, found his body over Greens Bay, and they went and reported to the Coast Guard. And then Johnny Andy Gallagher and my dad were sent out because they knew him with your dad to bring the body back. And he had, that was January 1st, 1937, was Captain Hill's last trip. He and his son Leon, Leon had been the engineer, then he trained Bruce McDonough to do it. And Captain Hill was paid off in full that day. Very, he even had his train tickets for his oh home over God. in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. He had the two train tickets in his pocket for he and his son. And then, uh, and the, all that money, I forget how much money it was. Your brother Joe knew what it was. I don't remember now what it was, but Joe knew exactly how much. And what. the Merrill, the stack of the Merrill um, was used as a culvert it's for CMU for a lot light. of years. And they knew where it was, so it was recently dug up, probably in the last five, six years, and it's over at the Marine yeah, Museum. It was over at the, uh, well, no, it was the Bird Farm, it was a culvert. But now it's at the Marine Museum. But anyway, uh, then. So they got his body back, and then his son Leon's body drifted all the way over by Escanaba. They found it over in Escanaba the following spring. And, uh, my mother, my mother, and a bunch of kids were on top of Mount Pisgah that day when the Merrill blew up, and there were she didn't quite know what it was. They could see it from the top of Mount Pisgah because they could look across Hog Island toward uh, Simmons Reef, but Jewel Gillespie was with them. And he knew what was going on, and they were young people in those, what, 36? And, um, and Jewel said, oh my God, that has to be the Merrill. And of course, my mother had to get all the way back to town. There was no roads out there then, knowing that her uncle, Bruce McDonough, was on that boat. She said it was the longest trek she ever had to walk back to town. Right. Now, Stanley and Jewel were up on top of uh, with a bunch of other kids, yeah. And there are videos available of the salvage. I mean, you'd see people going out there, if, you know, people would um, go through the ice in their trucks and they'd have to haul out their frozen bodies. I mean, it was just, they finally had to put a stop to that because well, it got out of It hand. came from the UP with trucks across yeah. the ice in the wintertime. There's pictures of all kinds of vehicles around the remains of the Merrill. Well, the one truck went down, it, it overloaded too much. And Charlie and Martin was out there and getting a little bit. And this guy, he had a, he had four or five 55 gallon drums full. And Charlie said, don't try that. He said, you'll never get down. You'll never get away with that. So the guy went about two miles and down he went. And they, in the spring, they pulled him in the truck. He was still sitting at the wheel. 
Is the mail the one that, that blew up on like New Year's Eve? New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. uh, that story that Alvin just told is what I'm talking about that needs to be pre preserved. Every family here and descendants of the old family, summer residents, all know a lot of stories that we have to somehow at some point start collecting to keep. Because it's they're funny stories and they're tragic stories, but they're part of the history mm -hmm. in the stories of the families. Uh, I heard tell if you send those stories to that editor of the Northern Islanders, you'd probably publish them. <laughs> 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 the record for the next hundred years. <laughs> well, I'm putting on the back of my tombstone, my kids know it, finally come I get to relax. <laughs> I'll do it ten years from now when I have a little time, Cynthia. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else is welcome to submit. Mr. Hill, um, the lady you were talking about, yeah. she sent me that, that story that you guys told. Yeah, how she got to be brown. I want to know, where are the lots? They don't exist. Can they? That they